Hello and welcome to The Other Marthas, the show where a drama student and a film graduate try to make sense of things we wish we were qualified in instead. A quick disclaimer before we get started, we don't claim to be experts in any of the fields we'll be discussing, so while everything we say will be based on individual research, it's just a bit of fun and we suggest that you take everything we say with a pinch of salt. Today we give you part three of our Everest blockbuster series in which we discuss our own views on Everest, climbing and the ethics of leaving someone to die or rescuing someone risking your own life on the mountain. <laughs> It's, it's like, I, I think a lot of the time, heroic or good acts are, are seen as expected. And therefore, if people don't rise to that, then it's like they failed. Um, mm. Whereas, in fact, it it's amazing if someone can, for example, risk themselves to save another life. But it shouldn't be expected. On the front cover of the book I read, mm. the quote is, on Everest, morality stops at 8,000 metres. I think it's yeah. just a completely different world like yeah. in everyday life you see someone like having some sort of medical emergency of course yeah. you're going to help them yeah no question no but when you're then potentially causing the end to your own life yeah or the lives like, of others who are climbing with you well exactly because when you're climbing in a team it's not just one person's decision mm. and i think that's what's so good about having someone further down the mountain to radio to yeah you can say try and send someone else now. up or say stop yeah. now yeah so i've got quite a long quote um, oh. about saving other people and things do mm. you want to hear it please so this is from um a climber called o'dowd mm -hmm. um and she's a woman yay um it's been a very man heavy episode but here is a woman well, and there was also wonderful charlotte. charlotte i'm so wonderful sorry she charlotte. wasn't in the original story i was telling but she's clearly a hero yes um so o o'dowd says each step higher is a personal choice and a personal responsibility we need mm. to be very clear about that before we venture out as mountaineering becomes more of a spectator sport due to websites and satellite telephones, we will increasingly have to answer questions about choices and responsibilities to a curious and largely ill-informed audience. That yeah, audience good is point. Us. Um, yes. She goes on, uh, whose choice is risk in the end? It is not that of the person who, is it not that of the person who goes out to do it? Mm. We live in a blame society which demands explanations and accountability, finding scapegoats if necessary. If I walk on the narrow edges of life, I do it because I choose to. If that edge breaks under me, I accept that as a consequence of my choice. Mm. I cannot blame others for what happened, nor do I expect those who accompany me on that edge, if they do, should carry blame for my decisions. I made a choice and I live or die by it. Death is not the intention, but is accepted as a possibility given the risk of the activity yeah i think that sums it up perfectly and that's from her book just for the love of it mm. yeah yeah and i think there's a it's possibly important to say as well it's, there's a big difference between um leaving someone who's completely unresponsive and leaving someone who is still um visibly fighting to stay alive Mm. because yeah there's a huge difference and then again obviously there's cases like Beck Weathers where miraculously from an apparent hypothermic coma he just got up and stumbled into camp and supposedly what drove him um he came to um he was feeling great because as he puts it um everything that was exposed was dead and you don't feel it if you're dead so he thought he was in bed um and then he saw his wife and children in front of him and he went ah <laughs> oh oh yeah because uh, he was like i'm not i don't think that's where i am oh um right. and then just the thought of getting back to them drove him which uh, is remarkable but i think it's also pertinent to note that i'm sure there are other people who if their love could have driven them to survive it absolutely would have but it's not always down to that. Um, but Beck no, Weathers, yeah. for whatever reason, was then physically capable of... Um... Actually, there was, a, there was a really interesting TED talk about this where they were hypothetically looking at his brain um, and how it would shut down during the process of um, hypothermia. 
and then how basically uh, the emotional core, um, I think the center of emotion, is it the hypothalamus, hippocampus? I don't, I have no idea. Um, Whatever it is. That um, would start working again because he suddenly has this really strong image of the people he loves back home. Oh, and that's interesting that... because also there's like the the idea of the you see your life flash before your eyes. Yeah, it makes sense that the most emotional points of your life would, if that's the last part that shuts down. True, true. Actually, yeah, that's a good point. If it's a, a, a last ditch thing where it's like let's activate this part of your brain to see if that can then activate the other bits that can actually that's amazing make you that that happened. Out. Yeah, I know, okay. I know. Um, so similar with um Beck Weathers. We have Lincoln Hall, yes, who was also um, left on Everest. He was with his guide, and I think his guide was advised to leave him. I've done yes. less research on this just because, for length of the podcast, I didn't want mm. to have another like Huge ten story, pages yeah. of notes. I think I. I've heard he was with like four Sherpas, possibly, who really, really well. This didn't want this to leave was him, later. But... Yeah, right, the, right, right. so he um, was with his guide, and they left him. And it was sort of like throughout um, a period of time, he was like sat, not doing anything, like yeah. kind of shuffling along. Like he was just not doing Everest in the anticipated way. Yes, and yeah. he had a bunch of people throughout the day come and try to encourage him down and it, it wasn't happening yeah. and for the safety of the people with him they were brought down exactly he had um, i think he had cerebral edema didn't he so he was like they were trying to help him down he was fighting them which is just yes. not well, this is later as well right <laughs> stop sorry i'm getting story. ahead of myself yes um so lincoln hall spent the night on everest um he reports again he's written a book about his experience um he reports that he was lying on his side very near the edge which terrifies Ugh. me and he woke up and saw um the sun mm -hmm. and the like the colors that the sun uh, i don't know if it was sunset or sunrise mm. and he also remembered his wife and oh. i believe his child and that is also what inspired him mm. to stay alive um he was also moving around up there um so i think that's sort of like basically what they said in the what nick said in the book was that lincoln hall was an experienced climber and he had enough experience that his kind of muscle memory and his training took over that so while he was hallucinating that he was in a tibetan village and huh. in bed with his wife and like in paris like yeah. he was not there but his yeah. body was he was keeping himself warm yeah. and he was going through what he needed to to survive I mean, the human body is incredible yeah and i also love that he was like off somewhere else um yeah one of the guys in the documentary said that he was away with the fairies which <laughs> i like um <laughs> i always have loved that phrase mm. um and he was brought down. Um, so yeah, as you said, um, a group of four Sherpas were sent up to rescue him. And he, um, I, I don't know if it was a cerebral edema, if that's what you've heard, then sure. Um, but he was apparently fighting them. But the way he remembers it was that they were threatening to beat him with an ax and at one point did hit him and Jeez. had bruised ribs. But he asked them about it at dinner because yeah. they threw like a celebration dinner yeah and he was like did you guys hit me and they were like no and he's like i have bruises <laughs> so but that might be from something else but he yeah. but because they say no and he says yes and he was not completely With there it. at the time Amazing. you know not particularly lucid no one will ever know what happened I, they might, you know, these guys have been sent up to rescue this guy who's Yeah, if you've got to hit him, you hit him. Yes, like, if you need to hit him to bring him down the mountain, yeah. crack on, I say. Oh, God, yeah. Um, Can you imagine so, the backlash if you're like, oh, well, he didn't want to come down, and 
the only thing we could think of to do was hit him and we didn't want to do that so we left him yeah <laughs> that's exactly. not gonna happen I, is it no um so when he was discovered i like this um there were some climbers they came up they thought that he had started before them and then realized he had been on everest all night mm. um and when he was discovered he said I imagine you're surprised to see me. <laughs> he was also in the process of changing his shirt. Um, oh and God. every time they tried to put warm things on him, he took them off, which we spoke about a few episodes ago, might have been Paradox um, paradoxical undress- undressing. Although I also heard um, that he, in his hallucinations, one of the things that he saw was like this cape of death and he was trying to take it off so yes but again that's probably like partially him feeling um too hot and also yes probably everything's not completely ticking yeah. where it should be because hall was brought down alive from quite high up that was another reason and this is the same season 2006 it was oh. another reason why people were critical of the team that decided to leave sharp mm. um however it was not nearly as cold as it was on Lincoln Hall's night as it was mm. on Sharp's night. Um, and it took 15 Sherpas, lots of oxygen and 20 hours to bring him down. Wow. The other difference is while he wasn't lucid, he could move. Yeah. He wasn't massively cooperative, but he could walk down the mountain. Yeah. And, um, you know, as we've said, if you can walk down, even if you're beating everyone up as you come down the mountain, you have, you a, have chance. a chance. Yeah. Um, so that is Lincoln Hall and his story. Brilliant. This is a quote again. Nick, our boy. Classic. Everest displayed a weakness much more dangerous than death to humankind. Lack of compassion, selfish ambition and silence. Oof. Absolute tea. But Nick is sort of it seems, I'd say he's a fan of Bryce. Mm-hmm. And there are people that are really not a fan of Bryce. Yeah. Um, so bear in mind that I've read a fairly biased account of, well, I read, yeah, a fairly biased account of the events. And then I watched a documentary that Bryce was in. So, yeah. But in general, I mean, Bryce's group are the yes. only ones who can really tell us what happened when they encountered sharp so like we can't really question them because that is the only account yes well yes and i think so um in the book um nick interviewed everyone involved and his conclusion was the more i learned about the particulars surrounding sharp's death the less controversial it seemed to be sharp had known the risk the ridge presented and yet he had chosen to climb without support and with minimal oxygen yeah he wanted to court the dangers of everest he had done so with determined forethought yeah and i just think like obvi- i think that everest and i think you know like me and you share this mm. um because most of us know it's not something we'll ever do it is fascinating and mm. part of human fascination is morbid curiosity at Absolutely. all of the corpses because humans love death. We love it. Yeah. And because we don't so, get it because we can't. Exactly. I think like most people are fascinated by either things that terrify us and things that we don't understand. Yes. And death is two of those. And death alone in a freezing place that's remote from everything we know is familiar Mm. very interesting because it's even more incomprehensible than just getting hit by a bus and dying yeah yeah and just what what motivates you to keep on going if you're in a situation like are you determined that well i won't die even if it seems wildly likely that you will or are you going i will die but hey, I want to see the summit first. Or um, yes, that's that's so interesting to me. Mm. The the 
what mindset do you go with? And it must be that you won't die because I don't know that you could rationally go into a situation knowing this will be the death of me and then have enough because like we've so spoken quite a lot about the summit being halfway yeah and i think if you are climbing with the thought in your mind that you will die then you stay at the summit well then what is your motivation for coming down because in the book they said like most of the time the motivation for coming down and surviving the descent which i think it's 80 percent of climbers that have died on everest died on the descent yeah it's a lot um they like they said most of the time the climbers that come down come down because they want simple comforts like their family a warm bed tea Mm. like it's and so i think climbing everest and reaching the summit is to like reach the highest point on earth and Mm. then when you come back down it's to reach the smallest things and the most simple things that are really easy to achieve yeah yeah i know what you mean you've done Um, the hardest thing yeah i think yeah i think definitely your motivation to try and come down wouldn't really make any sense if you went up there sort of intending to die um but then i also it's an intersection i've talked to you about before um i'm really curious as to um sort of the statistics and mindsets of suicidal climbers because i'm sure they exist um a lot of people i think who undertake thrill sports and risky endeavors are people who um are or have been quite depressed um and there's people misunderstand being suicidal as well as um always meaning that you seek to end your own life when in fact it can manifest itself um in just having very little regard for your own life or your own safety so um if it's in the balance you don't weigh it nearly as heavily as as someone who's not suicidal might um so with things like that you might be going well i kind of want to die anyway um might as well imagine if i can climb everest first but then i think again you would have to have a part of you that was like like I can imagine it almost being easier to climb Everest if your point of view is, if I die, I really don't mind. Um, I think it would be... Um, I think it would be perhaps physically easier because if you have no regard for your physical being, mm. your body, you're not... Wor- like, for example, I can't remember if it was Ingalls or Hall who spoke about this but they were saying that they felt well it's a he either way that he was saying that he felt his fingers were frostbitten Mm. and so when he had to climb the ladder he was really worried because putting any once you have frostbitten fingers if you put pressure on it that's where the danger comes in and so like he was being really careful of that because he didn't want to lose his mm. fingers. Whereas you can push and, yourself however hard you physically can go if you have no regard for what happens afterwards physically. Yeah, I think... Mm. I, I can see that intersection. And I think you would have to leave something at camp and be very clear with your... whatever you leave behind, saying, if I you know if i die up here if i get lost up here if something happens to me like leave me yes because like (laughs) it would be a very terrible feeling if you had gone up with no regard for your own safety and actually had caused the deaths of other people absolutely because i i see that and i i think that if that's the case for quite a lot of climbers i do think that it is very dangerous because yeah like having no regard for your own safety when it doesn't affect other people i mean and i think in call. some way it would always reflect affect other people i yes, don't think there's because any other way people in which... will always care about other people even if they don't know you yeah like if you throw yourself in front of a train in front of strangers very likely multiple people will reach out for you 
and it's possible that one of those people will lose their balance like that any situation. and also even you know um the person driving the train the person yeah. that has to clean up after you yeah like there's always going to be an impact on other people someone and has so, to find you at some point yes and so i think like i think that if that intersection in climbing was a high number i think that there would be even more i think climbing would be even more dangerous for everyone else especially because there are so many people who climb everest like even if you if you google everest summit you don't get to see like initially all the pretty pictures from the Mm. summit you see cues of people and if there are some people on that who are not being careful for themselves it will immediately put other people who are very cautious climbers at risk. I agree. I think the thing is, if you did go up, I think it would be very hard to go up with the intention of dying um, just because of everything that we've said. And also, I don't know, it would be difficult to just stay on the summit and to have people going that move and you're like, uh, no, like I feel like you would be moved and then you'd be like, well, I guess I'll go down the mountain now. Yeah, uh, I, I think, I think while it seems very easy to die on Everest, like there's people say like, yes, some people fall to their deaths. Mm. Other people just sit down and fade away and it can take days. Mm. Like, I just think, I think that there might be climbers. I mean, they're, most likely are climbers who don't have any regard for their own life but do have enough regard for other people's lives Mm. that while they don't mind if it ends their life they aren't actively trying yes that's that's what i was going to get at eventually as well is is, yes i don't one thing to be okay with it if that is what happens but yes to go with the intention would be quite a an odd and ultimately quite a selfish thing to do i don't think that there are many people who are climbing everest with the intention to die no i think there are people that climb everest with the knowledge that they might die and And being kind of okay with that that. yeah yeah i I think even that might not even be a completely like suicidal viewpoint that might just be you know like this woman was saying she lives like on the edge yeah (laughs) just at peace with the idea that you may die yes and i think those are different things definitely 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 actively wanting to die or being okay with it and being at peace with it but not seeking it definitely um i think also uh it's worth mentioning that obviously everest is hugely expensive yes Um, true and so that won't be accessible for the vast majority of people. And also, even if that were accessible to you, um, anyone who's not hugely wealthy um, and who has any cause or person that they will be leaving behind um, would presumably want to leave that money to the people who will be grieving them or to the causes that they've lived their life for, as opposed yes. to climbing some of a mountain. Yeah, I I just don't I don't I don't think it would be a thing that someone would yeah. be like I'm going to spend eight thousand pounds I'm going to take myself off to Everest and I'm going to sit down and die. Yeah. I think that that if that was the case, it, we probably would have heard of it before. Definitely, um, and I think uh, often it's an interesting thing, like when people are quite depressed and um, they seek, because often when you're depressed you seek things that make you feel in big ways uh, mm-hmm. because it's difficult to at a smaller level um not everyone with depression but sometimes um and i think in cases where perhaps you have less regard for your own safety um and you feel you wouldn't mind at all if you died there's the flip side to that of but if i survive you've seen the world in a way that you have seen nothing like it before well Um, and also what i was saying about like generally people that have summited everest 
the things that they crave are the small things. Yeah. Like, I'm not saying that it would cure someone's depression. No, but you might sort of appreciate in a different way. Yeah, it might help people to appreciate smaller things. Yeah. And like, oh, I remember when I was on this mountain and all my toes were falling off. Yeah, and just the physical drive and the camaraderie, I think, which isn't, by the way, (laughs) me endorsing... um, deliberately putting yourself into dangerous situations to feel things that's not advisable no, that's um, not what we're advising no but i i can see where the temptation might come from if you're in a dark place and that's accessible to you on a different note mm-hmm. i was talking to my parents about what i would be like if i was to climb everest and i know for a fact that currently i would not be able to summit everest first mm. of all I am not a mountain climber, which I think is one of the parts that really you need. Yes. Um, But (laughs) if I were a mountain climber, well, I'm not, so I don't know. But my point is, if I was on Everest, first of all, I would be one of the people like, move. Yeah. I'm trying to get up this mountain because when I'm like cycling up a hill, even when I'm driving up a hill and it's like a steep hill, there's there's some there's some work that goes into that walking up a hill like if someone else is in my way and i can't it's have it the momentum you. i need yes. because that's the thing is especially with cycling like you need to go fast up mm. the hill if you're all behind, stuck behind someone, someone's the worst yes and like my mum is like an absolute like <laughs> robot and not in an average she's like a she's like a machine at cycling right. Like she stays seated, she goes the exact same speed up the hill and not slow, just not fast. And mm. I, I don't know how she does it. She, the woman's got calves of steel, but I don't. I have no. carv- car- calves of muscle. Yeah. And thus I need to go fast at the hill and then fast up the hill to get up it if I have yeah. any hope. Makes sense. And I think I would be the same on Everest. I'd be like, move out of my way. Like, obviously, I would not be running up Everest. (laughs) But I would Take a run up and just leap for the summit. First of all, I think I would just hate having anyone in front of me because I hate that. Yeah, I I think you would be really miserable. Oh, I would hate it. The other thing I was saying to my mum, I was saying, um, I think on Everest... I would be one of the people that just sat down and they'd be like, Martha, this is the death zone. You can't just sit down. I'd be like, I'm like, sitting I down. Don't care. Yeah. I'd be like, I'm sitting down. I'm having a chocolate digestive and I don't care. And that's and what I would reckon... happen. The thing is, if we were on the same expedition, I'd probably be um, like, obviously I've not experienced these conditions before, but it's the kind of thing that I do relish. So I'd probably be going, Oh my God, this is amazing. Obviously horribly hot. I'm in a lot of pain but mm-hmm. kind of kind of loving it and then you go and sit down and I'd be like god damn it and then I'd have to abandon my summit attempt to be like Martha what are you doing I put the digestive down and like trying I'd, to kick you down the hill I would be like sat in green boots cave like you crack onto the summit <laughs> I'll have my digest digestives and I'll see you later <laughs> and I'll be like I'll be damned if my reputation is <laughs> And I would as well. Smirched by you sitting in a you goddamn cave eating a digestive. I'd probably, I'd probably choke on my digestive just to spite you for leaving me behind. <laughs> yeah, but then I could just like call a couple more climbers and be like, let's just poke Martha until she gets so annoyed she stomps off. That's all we'd have the to thing do. Is, the thing is, is I, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't be. I don't think I would have the energy to be as rageful as I often am. Yeah, I would just be just tired and I would just be like, I'm eating my biscuits. You got, you lot carry on. And I reckon I would probably be frozen, sat down, holding a biscuit, biscuit. and pulling an angry face at someone. <laughs> to and be that fair, would what a way to be go. my legacy. And I mean, I, I die as I live, angrily eating <laughs> digestives or shouting at people. Brilliant. I mean, on that note... (laughs) You know, though, I think it's valuable that I know that about myself. Yes, I agree. I know, like, here's the thing. 
Um, if anyone's watched Community, I did have a moment whilst I was doing all my Everest research, similar to the Dean, but very different, where I was doing all this Everest research and I was like, I really hope this doesn't awaken anything in me. Because, oh, yeah. like, there's the Everest bug that people get and they read all the adventure books and they, like, know all about it and all they want to do is climb Everest. Yeah. And here's the thing. I know I'm not capable. Yeah. Like... I wish I was. I would love to be one of those like, cool people who's mm. like, I've climbed Everest, I've summited Everest, go me. But I know I wouldn't be. I yeah. might I might hit up base camp, not advanced base camp, just no, base no. camp, with my millet boots and my yes. and my puffer jacket, and they'd be like, You don't need that for here. And I'd be like, oh, I actually I do. bought it for a film <laughs> set. So <laughs> let me wear it. Yeah. Um you know, that might be something I do, but I mm. just I just know that I like every night getting into a lovely cozy bed and <laughs> having a sleep. Yeah. And not dying. Yes. At not altitude. fearing that if you go to sleep, you're not waking up. Yeah. I like I would love to be one of those adventure people. And I do love an adventure. Mm. I just love um slightly more safe adventure. Yeah. And I think that's a really um remarkable thing in its own right as well um no in that because i think it's really admirable for people to find a sense of adventure in the things that other people might see as mundane like that shows a lot of sort of imagination and um just I, I don't know an adventurous spirit i think it's like um people who are easily bored might then be the same people who consequently go on to do a load of different projects at once, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. But equally, it's really, really valuable um, to not be bored very much because you always manage to occupy your mind with something, you know? Yeah, I think, I think the other thing with me <laughs> hypothetically climbing Everest is that I know I would only get so far and it wouldn't be high mm. and i would be like i cannot continue to do this mm. i am gonna turn around and so like even though technically you've climbed everest um because once you've climbed on everest you've climbed it i guess you just haven't summited True. um i think i would be like I know I can't do this, and I've now wasted forty thousand yeah, dollars on climbing <laughs> five steps from yeah. advanced base camp. And now, what do I do with that? Yeah, you can't ask for your money back if you've decided it's not. No. <laughs> Although oh. I suppose, like, I don't know if it's true, oh. but I know that um, they attempted to bring in a rule that you had to climb at least one thousand meter mountain before that's whatever. cool the so like i suppose i would have tried you know a slightly shorter mountain and yeah. gone oh turns out mountain climbing is not, not for me. me what about knitting yeah. yeah exactly but it really just depends like altitude sickness just hits people randomly I remember when um again i've climbed the salkantai trail um to get to machu picchu and the salkantai pass is considerably higher than machu picchu i believe it's about fifteen thousand feet um <laughs> where the pass goes through, um, which is fine. Uh, well, I say that it, it really depends. You can feel the altitude. For me, it was fine. Um, for a lot of others, it was fine. For some people, they were feeling, you know, unwell and having to stop and things, but they were okay. Uh, and then this one guy who was like, this really um, fit young American guy um, had to go on a mule's back just because he was like, wow well i can't walk and they were like that's okay go on this mule and he was like all right yeah i think you can never tell how your body would react to something like that no and you can't train for you it you can be well, you can, but... like massively fit and still struggle like yeah. I, be very I've, also but... I've also seen that um at altitude your body burns muscle rather than fat because it's easier to convert Oh. And so a lot of climbers after Everest actually 
have like not a lot of muscle at all which must wow. make climbing even harder because yeah. you've lost a lot of your muscle mass god so um, you'd have to be doing altitude training but then also quite a lot of non-altitude training to keep your muscle mass up yeah i wonder if like um if you had like loads of muscles you'd be better well obviously yes if you had loads of muscles you would be, be better, better at climbing yeah. Everest because you're stronger anyway yeah. and so you have more muscles to burn mm. so yes um <laughs> ignore me so martha you're quite an adventurous soul yes everest you doing it well here's the thing um i i doubt i ever would but i so get it like the thing that they talk about and they're like and you can see this thing you start climbing and then and then you get to the balcony and it's like everything's suddenly laid out in front of you and i'm like Ugh. um because i do again i i, I am a like a very, I'm a very sensible person, mm. but I'm kind of a thrill seeker when it's just me at stake and I feel that I'm in control. Yeah, um, I think that's. I I would say that's true about you. If it's mm, just you, yeah, like you're, um, you're very careful about other people. Yes, but if it's just you, you are more um, slapdash. Not slap. I feel like it's it's not brave because it can be brave to decide to. Oh, absolutely, not do not stuff. Um, reckless. Yes, you. Yes, yes, that's a good word for yeah. it. Yeah, like I. Um, and again, this is nothing like Everest, but in, um, in Peru, I was in a city called Iquitos, which is beautiful, um, and I found it quite boring. Um, <laughs> so, and I had a day left in there. I wasn't sure what to do and I saw a volcano that I thought looked close and I looked it up and it was Mount Misty um which has plenty of folklore and it's all all cool um and I looked you know around the travel shops and they were doing Mount Misty tours they were really expensive so I went none of that for me thanks um and just walked until I got to the mountain and then like free climbed up um I wouldn't even have got anywhere near base camp um but I, what I didn't realise was that there's literally no road until base camp. Um, I'm not sure how people get up there. there maybe there's like a, a bus track or something somewhere. Um, but I was literally just hanging on to bushes going... <laughs> um, and then I got somewhere in a pretty low down in the foothills and sat on a hill. It was absolutely lovely. There were Hummingbirds came like maybe 30 centimetres from my face. I read Dracula. <laughs> Had a great time. Yeah, and that's the thing about you is that mm. I could definitely see you wanting to do that. Yeah. And so when I was like reading all my Everest stuff <laughs> and like, I think the thing is, is I enjoy learning about things, even though I know I'll never do it. Mm. Like I love learning about marine biologists. Yeah. I know it's almost like definitely likely that I will not be a marine yeah. biologist. In fact, I may not even dive into the ocean for Ever, some yeah. sightseeing. It might never happen for me. Um, but I still like to learn about it. But when mm. I was like, this better not awaken anything in me. I was like, this better not awaken anything in Martha. Just it's, because, mm. like, obviously, if you wanted to climb Everest, I, I'd be back in you. I'd get you. It's just I've read about a lot of death. I know, I know. <laughs> I think the thing, I am, I am very sensible and I... Uh, I think I'd be good at mitigating um, and being reasonable about what I wanted if I did want to do that. Um, and also, I'm a drama student. I'm never going to have 40 grand to spare in my life. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so please don't, don't worry. Please don't go with one of the cheap yeah, ones. Yeah, I'm not going to go with Asian around, trekking. If you turn around to me and say, oh, Martha, I've only, sp I've, I've only gone and spent $8,000 on, um, on a tour for Everest, I'd be like, okay first of all how do we get your money back second yeah. of all you're not going like yeah <laughs> like uh, i think there are just there are levels that yeah um like i know that again i'm never going but i mean i might be saying all this and then i might be like i'm off to everest yeah. in like 15 years who knows who knows um but i did find um, a quote that I've actually written in my notes mm. for Martha. <laughs> <It> <laughs> oh says, no! So I thought it might be nice um, 
<laughs> we might not end on it, but we may right, do. Yeah, go on, go on. Uh, so this is from guide and expedition leader Eric Simonson. I never feel euphoric or elated when I'm up there, just anxious. It's like swimming as far out into the ocean as you can, then turning around and wondering if you can make it back. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> Go to Everest, I like you too much. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, very touched that you've <laughs> gone to the trouble of making it seem like a highly unappealing prospect. <laughs> um, I, I will most probably never go, and if I do, I'll be sensible about it. I'll, I'll come and stay at base camp while you're been. there. Yeah, so you can just radio me and be like, Martha, turn around now. Oh I'll no, like, but I wouldn't, hmm. I wouldn't do that. I would, I would go, I'd go and knock on Bryce's door and be like, right, send Ferber up there right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> we need him. Um, no, but the reason, the re I joke that it was for you because not to stop you from going to Everest, but because the ocean was Yeah, involved. yeah, yeah, I got you. Um, but I actually found it really interesting that it is sort of like that where you do physical exertion that takes you to a place that if you stay there you will die yes but you have to get back and, and you, you don't know, know if you, you have the yes yeah, yeah and that's I get unfortunately that's something I find quite thrilling like mm. um in again situations nowhere near this like fatality not on the cards but if there is a situation where I'm like pretty high in this tree not sure I'll be able to access that branch below me. Oh well, then yes, my overriding like instinct is to keep going to the top and then just be at well, the top like woohoo and then figure it out when I go the other way. Yeah, and I think the other thing that I've seen is like, oh, people say um, you need to keep enough in your enough energy in your tank yes. to be able to come down from the summit and remember that down is harder yeah. and up feels impossible. Yeah. With, again, I feel like I bring this up every episode, but it always gets cut because it's never actually relevant. <laughs> <laughs> but like, because as someone with depression, um, and Beck Weathers actually talked about this as well, pushing yourself really hard physically kind of makes it impossible to think, and that can be so refreshing. Um, and also, if you do have quite severe depression, generally you're very used to running on empty. So the feeling of, I have no idea. I have no energy, but somehow, but somehow, I'm doing something. Feels feasible, which is probably a very dangerous, naive way of thinking, because physically, you have limits. I think also because a lot of my curiosity about Everest is morbid curiosity about all yeah. of the deaths. I think it's just like I think there are there are people that enjoy learning about Everest and other mountains because they enjoy the the not even they're not always success stories like there are expeditions that have failed but that paved the way mm. that are like praised mm. but i think um a lot of the time it must be that climbers that are successful often don't dwell on the deaths that are on the mountains. I mean, you sort of have to Where, not, really. Whereas, because that's all I've ever learned about Everest, I sort of think, like, you might even be... And um, I'm also reading Thin Air by Michelle Paver. As oh, well, yeah. Where they climb Kanchenjunga in, like, 1936. Wow. Um and they're following the footsteps of a failed expedition. Oh and I think I would be going, oh, and that's where that person died. Oh, and yeah, yeah, where yeah, that yeah, person yeah, died. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm turning back around because I've just walked over a hundred corpses. Yes. It's a good point. Yeah. I don't know. I just, <sighs> no, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I was wondering, um, mm. that you said in yours was, mm. um, Beckweathers, he had had eye surgery. Yes. And one of my guys had had surgery as well. Yeah. Now, why would you not wait? <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Hmm. But um, you can't get on planes often if you've just had surgery because of the altitude. And That's I know that planes. 
can fly higher, but not much higher because Everest pokes out of the atmosphere yeah. and then they're in space. So surely not at all higher. Yeah. And so why is it advisable to do strenuous physical activity? Um, <laughs> I'm sure it's not, but yeah, I don't know just why it's allowed. It might just um, be like, well, the doctors know they're going to do it, so they'll yeah. accommodate. Yeah, or it might be a case of, like, doctors may advise you not to fly or climb Everest. But I like, I don't know if an airline, for instance, can actually refuse to take someone on the plane on the grounds I that they... I think they can. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, I think they can, but I, I think the thing is, is that the doctor who advises you, it's not their problem, and the company that takes you you surely signs so much that it's not their problem yeah exactly and so it is your own decision whereas the airline it's the airline's decision if they let you on the plane true actually because yeah. when i had my um eye smashed in on holiday oh yeah and i had stitches mm. i was worried that they wouldn't let me fly Aww. um because it can like cause the wound to start bleeding later. yeah i think we've basically done Everest there yeah thank you for listening to the other Marthas the show where a drama student and a film graduate talk about things we have no business talking about if you enjoyed this episode please do subscribe to our channel for more